Do battle in the spirit. Mark chapter 14. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, that he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you didn't seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So when we read the word, I think it's always good to ask ourselves, why are these particular details given here? And why are they given in this particular way? So as we read through this and study it today, let's keep that in mind. Why has Mark chosen, why has the Holy Spirit chosen through Mark to give us these particular details? And why in this particular way? Just have that as a sort of background question in your mind as we go along. So if we start in verse 43, immediately while Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12, and he's got this crowd with him that are armed with weapons to arrest Jesus. So Judas was one of the 12, and the Holy Spirit points out here, emphasizes this fact that Judas was one of the 12. He was one of the 12 disciples that had been with Jesus for three years that had shared life with Jesus for three years. He'd seen the miracles, he'd heard the teaching, he'd witnessed the love and the power and the grace of God in Jesus. He was one of this close-knit, tight band of followers, of disciples. And yet here he is with a crowd to arrest Jesus. He's the betrayer. And he's going to betray Jesus into the hands of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. The chief priests, the elders, the scribes, they're the religious authorities of the time. They're the men to whom God entrusted the responsibility and the authority to minister the word of God, to minister the presence of God to the people. They're the religious leaders. But they're not living by the spirit of God. They're not living by the word of God. And so Judas is betraying Jesus into their hands. He's taking the light of the world and he's betraying that light of the world into the hands of religion. You can think of this in terms of our own lives. Sometimes we're tempted to take what Jesus is doing in our lives, the light of the world, how he's working in our lives, Take that and hand it over to religion. Instead of relying on the Holy Spirit, the word of God, instead of doing that, to live our life on a different basis, to live our life or to make decisions on a basis that doesn't rely on the spirit and on the word of God. Do you see that? It's like a betrayal. It can happen in different areas of our lives. And you'll see that that's quite a theme through this passage the betrayal of life into the hands of religion. A great working definition, I think, of religion, or I should say empty religion, because there is good religion. As the Bible says, true religion, look after the widows, the fatherless, and keep pure from the world. But there's empty religion. A good, a good working definition of empty religion is to be very principled, but not to rely on the spirit and the word of God. You can have very strong principles, stick to them, But if we don't live based on the spirit and the word of God, then those principles become our God. That's empty religion. And we can see all around us the effects of empty religion. So you have then this crowd 
coming to arrest Jesus, sent by the religious leaders, and they've come with swords and clubs. They're fighting in a human way. They're fighting in a human way. So reading on verse 44. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. So here you have Judas. And Judas comes up to Jesus and he greets him and he kisses him. Maybe a typical greeting, but nevertheless an affectionate one. We don't do that in England. It's a good old handshake. Good old handshake, yes. <laughs> I mean, as a slight aside, there's a brilliant translation of the New Testament that you may be aware of, J.B. Phillips. And there's a part where Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. But J.B. Phillips, he can't quite bring himself to say that, so he translates it. A friendly handshake all around, chaps. <laughs> yes. But the point being that it's an affectionate, friendly term of greeting that Judas gives to Jesus. It looks like love, doesn't it? But actually, the goal of it is to stop Jesus in his tracks. They seize him. And there are things that can develop in the church of God that look like love. But actually, underneath it, they're designed by the enemy to stop Jesus Christ, to bind him up, to stop his work. So, reading on, verse 47. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Okay, now, who? Who is this who drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear? Mark doesn't tell us. We know from another gospel that it was Peter, but that's not mentioned here. Remember, I said it's important to ask, why are these details here? Why is it said in this way? Why is this detail left out? Well, because for for Mark's purposes, for, for the Holy Spirit's purposes through Mark, it's not important who it was. He wants to focus on the action, on the deed, and the context of it, rather than the person. It's a very sudden action. It seems very reasonable. This crowd have come against Jesus with swords and clubs. It seems like the most logical thing to do. You've got a sword you're going to fight on behalf of your Lord. So it seems logical, reasonable. Does it not? Just do it. But it's a human way of fighting. It's a merely human way of fighting. He cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. He's not getting to the core of the problem, is he? The servant of the high priest, he's just... He's just a minion in this whole thing. If anything, he should be going for the high priest, but he's not going to get near him. Fighting in a human way, trying to fight a spiritual battle in a merely human way, is destined for failure. You'll only get to the high priest's servant's ear, as as far as you'll get, no further. You'll achieve nothing. All Peter did was prevent the guy from hearing now. Well, that's not much good when he needs to be hearing the word of God. Well, we know from another gospel that Jesus healed the man immediately. So he could hear again because hearing is important. And again, you'll see that theme in this passage. So this was a mere human response from this man with the sword. It was in human strength. It was human method. His motives were good. Let's face it, he's noble. He's trying to protect Jesus. But unfortunately, in the spiritual war in which we're engaged, good, noble motives aren't enough. Even Jesus said, I don't do anything that I haven't first seen my father doing. I do nothing on my own initiative, he said. I have a feeling that if he lived that way, that's how, we, how we're called to live as well. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, is it? It's with principalities and powers, spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. It's a very real battle, very real. But it's one we're called to fight. And if we're called to fight it, it means it's one that we can win. It's one we can win, but we have to fight in the spirit, in God's way. So this is Paul writing 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war 
according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So we walk in the flesh, we're humans. This is the life we live. Nothing wrong with that. It's what God gave us. But we don't wage our spiritual war in a merely human way. Our weapons, they're not merely human. They're not of the flesh. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. What kind of strongholds? He goes on to say, we destroy arguments. Every lofty opinion that raises itself against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's where the battle is typically fought. It's for people's minds, for their thought patterns, for their beliefs. And we know Satan is the father of lies. His principal weapon is lies. Our principal weapon is truth. The word of God wielded in the wisdom and the power of the Spirit of God. So our battle, we have to fight in the Spirit. It's a spiritual battle. If we go back now to Mark 14, verses 48 to 49. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the Scriptures be fulfilled. So he's saying, you've come to capture me. You didn't seize me in the temple. Capture, seize. Once again, the outcome of religion is the capturing, the seizing of Jesus. This is the outcome. When you had this group of people, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, who were principled men, but who were not living by the Spirit and the Word of God, then the outcome of their activity is to seize and capture Jesus, to try to prevent God's way, God's kingdom from being built. And in in any area of our life that we give over to empty religion, then the outcome is, in some sense or another, Jesus is, is captured. He can't do what he wants to do in the way he wants to do. Jesus says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. Now, just think about that for a moment. Swords and clubs contrasted with day after day, I was with you teaching. They've come with swords and clubs. That's their weapons. What was his weapon? I was with you, teaching. That was Jesus' weapon, his presence and his word in the temple, teaching the people. Do you see the contrast? That's the theme, the contrasted theme in this passage. Human means of fighting a spiritual battle or God's way. And God's way is the presence of God, i.e. the spirit and the word, i.e. in this case, the teaching, because the power is in the spirit and in the word. His presence and his teaching would obviously turn the world upside down and therefore put everything right. His spirit and his word from the very beginning have brought order out of chaos and have brought life from nothingness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the face of the waters and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. Bringing life from nothingness, bringing order from chaos through his spirit hovering over the waters through his word. So summing up so far, our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's a spiritual war. And we have spiritual weapons to fight with. And they are the weapons of the spirit and the word. Okay, moving on. Mark fourteen fifty, And they all left him and fled. 
Jesus had told them a short while before, you're all going to fall away. And Peter had protested, no, no, not me. I love you. I'm staying with you. How noble, how, what a good heart he had. Full of good intentions. So good. And the others then kind of, that gave them courage to say, we're not falling away either. But Jesus had told them, you are. You're not going to be able to go where I'm going. You're not going to have the strength. And here they are, as promised. They all fled. They left him, it says. They'd been with him three years, day and night, so close. But they couldn't stick. They couldn't stay. Why? Because their human strength wasn't enough. It was good, but it wasn't enough. And our human strength is not enough. It's just not enough. But there's this young man who followed him. It says a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. Now, why is this in here? Why is this detail in here? And why is it put in this way? Number one, why doesn't it tell us who this person is? And then why does it give us this detail? What's it adding to us? Well, firstly, it's a young man who followed him. And young men typically are characterised by courage and vision, commitment. This young man's got a heart. He's going to stick with Jesus. The others have all fled, but this young man's following. Young man. And he's wearing just a linen cloth. So he's naked apart from a linen cloth. What does the nakedness represent? Open heartedness, vulnerability, like Adam in Eden before the fall. Integrity. That's who this young man is. He's got integrity. He's open hearted. He's vulnerable. Linen cloth. What does a linen cloth represent in the Bible? They were clothed in white linen, which represents the righteous deeds of the saints. A linen cloth, good deeds. He's a young man with courage, with vision, with a pure heart. He's open, he's open to God, he's vulnerable. He's making himself vulnerable by following Jesus and he's clothed in good deeds. That's who he is. But is it enough? Is his goodness, is his strength, are his good deeds enough in this moment when the darkness really closes in? And the answer's no, because they seized him and he fled and he ran away naked. His strength and his righteous deeds are not enough to follow where Jesus is going. He's got a good heart, he's got good deeds, but it's not enough. So taking the two main themes that we've seen in this passage together, Number one, we're fighting a spiritual war and we have to fight spiritually in the spirit with the word of God because that's where the power is. And secondly, our good heart, our good deeds, excellent, brilliant, but not enough. We have to have the Holy Spirit. And of course, you go on through the story, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, The giving of the Holy Spirit, everything changes, doesn't it? These disciples who all fled become so bold and full of words to share by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we too, who've received of the same Spirit. In God's strength, we do have a sword, do we not? And it's not to cut off people's ears, it's to open their ears. And it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Not just the word on its own, because it has to be wielded in the spirit, but the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're going to continue to do battle, but we're going to be doing battle in the spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. 